lights. Well, speaking of lights, let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander, and I'm your host for the next hour. And in fact, let me just for the sake of politeness, I will take my goggles off. This is after all my Halloween costume. And let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. Uh, I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. We have a topic that's very dear to my heart, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Now, we've been working on the future of libraries as part of the future of higher education for as long as we've been around. We've hosted all kinds of great guests. And today, I'm really excited to host a couple of guests who've worked on a new book. Now, Library 2035, as you might guess, looks at the next 10 years of, higher, of libraries, not just academic libraries, but also K through 12 libraries and public libraries. Uh, if you look in the bottom left of the screen, you'll see there's a little lozenge shaped button there that says Library 2035. Click that and that'll take you to that page. I find the book just dense packed with information and ideas about where libraries might be headed. So I'd like to bring to the stage a couple of the people who have been instrumental in making this work. So first of all, uh, let me bring on the stage not only one of the writers, but also its editor. So let me welcome Sandy Hirsch. I should say good afternoon and good morning, Sandy, out in the West Coast. Hi, it's great to be here. Well, I'm so glad you could make it. Um, and uh, you have to tell us, is the weather beautiful out there? It is. <laughs> it is lovely. All right, we can all we can all bear up. We can all we can all come <laughs> um, Sandy, or of course, um, Professor Hirsch. I, I I did want to ask you to introduce yourself in our particular way, which is to ask you what you're going to be working on for the next year. So, what are the big projects? What are the big ideas that are top of mind for you for 2025? Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great way to kick off this conversation. Um, I actually have two um, big things that I'm working on. One is actually I'll be working on a new book. Um, I am waiting for the official uh, publisher approval, but uh, working with a couple of colleagues um, internationally to take a look at the historical trends and future projections and perspectives about library and information science education worldwide. Mm. So we'll mm. be taking a global look at that and um, and uh, and delving into that. And this is in honor of IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations. Uh, it's in honor of the section on education and training's 50th anniversary. So we're putting oh. together an edited work that'll focus on library and information science education worldwide. So I'm excited about that project. And then the other thing, and this is something I'd love folks have any thoughts about, um, is uh, one of the things I've been doing for many years now, is that's dating back to 2011, is I started something called the Library 2.0 Virtual Conference Series that's free. Mm -hmm. And every year we hold three mini conferences online and uh, we focus on different topics. So I'd love to hear the thoughts from this crowd um, in terms of any ideas. We're in the midst of our planning for 2025. So I'd love if you have any thoughts about um, topics that you think would be of interest. Last year we focused on AI and libraries. We looked at um, you know, patrons experiencing homelessness in the library and we did one that was focused around this book actually. So I'm interested in any thoughts that you might have. So feel free to, and to either reach out to me separately or in the chat. I'd love to hear. I have all kinds of thoughts. And just, just one is the first chapter in, in the book, actually, is climate change. So I'll just put that in there. But but I'm the, I'm the moderator today. I'm not a guest. So I'm, I'm not going to weigh in anymore. Um, it, it sounds like a great, uh, a great amount of work, Sandy. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the results. And folks, please chime in with uh, any of your thoughts. Use the chat box, or of course, if you'd like to uh, use the Q and A box, please feel free. And we'll circle back to that at the at the end today, Sandy. Um, but now I want to uh, bring on the stage one of your uh, collaborators, one of your uh, who did an awful lot of work on uh, one excellent article in the book. And we bring to the table uh, David Lankies. Hang on one minute. And there we go. The University of Texas. Hello, sir. Hello. Greetings from the University of Texas. Are you in Austin right now? I am in Austin right now, and it's good weather day because it's overcast, and we always appreciate a break from the sun. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I remember uh, when I was teaching in Louisiana, 
the first year, one of my students and I were walking across campus around this time, and he suddenly stopped. And he looked up at the sky and he just smiled. And I thought, are you okay? What is this? I felt the first breeze. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying that, David. So uh, you heard the question that I, I put to our friend Sandy. What are you working on for the next year? What are the big topics and the big projects for you? Well, I'm, I'm serving as an interim associate dean for academics, so most of it's just trying to keep my head above water. But right. um, to, to the spirit of the question, there's two. One, I'm actually, this is not my office. I, they lent me one. I'm, I'm the chair of the search committee for our academic library here at the University of Texas at Austin. So if anyone's looking for a job, Here's an interesting thing, but it's a, it's an interesting okay. conversation with the canvas, with the campus about what they see the library's role the next ten years is you know who do we want who do we find what do we worry about how they're going, the other one is I've been working uh, closely with uh, the library association and the national library in the Netherlands to talk about sort of library preparation and mission of libraries uh, across the 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 country. It's so interesting. They have some of the most outstanding libraries in the world. And the last time they gave out a library science degree was in the mid 1990s. And so the question is, how is that working? And um, if they're so innovative without library science program, Taylor Swift question, hi, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. Uh, to Sandy's point about looking at how LIS education can be restructured and such to promote innovation and not to pull people to some sort of mean. It's, a, it's an interesting Ooh questions going through my head so yeah that is interesting uh, that might be something that we get to talk about today um so well, let me just quickly rearrange the screen a little bit make things a bit more even so we can see everybody um and what i'm going to do today is to begin with friends if you're new to the forum is i'm going to ask our kind guests a couple of questions about their book about their work library 2035 and they're going to just hopefully have fun answering my questions uh, but then it's over to you so what questions you have, either if you've read the book or if you're one of the authors of the book, um, please feel free to put forth a question. But also, if you're interested in the general topic of where libraries might be headed, this is going to be your venue. This is going to be your opportunity. Uh, I, I just want to begin with, with one question here. Uh, I'm astonished, as I said in the introduction, by how much stuff, how many topics are in here. I, I had a a list of notes originally and it started growing into an index you know looking at surveillance technology community support staffing community leadership, government relations resilience changing demographic censorship global connections relationships open access dei more dei digital support fragmented and various physical but I, so all kinds of stuff and i one of the ways i had of wrapping my head around all this was the sense of libraries in crisis which is a long-standing theme but you also wrap that around with the theme of resilience uh, you know, your book begins by talking about COVID and how libraries went through COVID, both surviving on their own, but also helping their users slash people slash patrons in new and innovative ways. And that's my first question to ask you is, how do you see libraries being resilient for this next decade of a wild future? What's, what's the best way for libraries to be resilient? So, uh, so in my book chapter, um, thanks for that question. Um, in the, in my book chapter, which you may or may not have gotten to yet, because right. um, it's at the very end, um, I do talk a lot about resilience, and I um, I, I tap into my uh, Northern California uh, connection to the redwood trees, and and kind of do an um, form an analogy with the superpowers that redwood trees have in terms of their regeneration and regrowth and and um, how powerful those are, and I and I and I do think that libraries have uh, similar superpowers, and I think that they have that um, in part because I I believe that uh, where some of the core values that we have in the profession help us um, achieve some of that resilience in terms of um, relying on uh, you know our core values of access and of equity and trying to support the full communities. And so I think that from that standpoint of sustainability, you know, public good, some of these really core values I think are so important. And um, as we look to the future and draw on some of those um, values, I think that that will help provide us with some of that resilience and some of that strength. I also see that um, our, our um, libraries, uh, 
if speaking more about the um, ability to regenerate and to reframe, um, I think, you know, our libraries have not remained static. And I think that that is in a major point to our favor is that we have, as our communities and our communities needs have changed, so have libraries. And so it's not, uh, as, uh, it's not like we're standing still. If we do stand still, then that's not going to be a good end for us, for libraries. We need to keep moving and evolving into align with the changes in our society and technology and our community needs and those will be the things that will sustain us in the future and ensure that libraries will persevere and thrive in my opinion thank you very much i love the analogy um by the way which is very beautiful thank you thank you sandy uh, david would you like to add something to that um just a little so first a, a quick context that i recommend uh, i recommend the book you can skip my chapter it's fine but you have in there such a great variety of voices, not only from, you know, academic types, but people in the trenches that are doing this, people in academic libraries, people in public libraries that are really wrestling with this on a daily basis. And so you get a real span from the, the 30,000 foot view down to the negative six inch view of what's happening. Um, I think that, that the trick with libraries as with any institutions, because we can talk about higher education as well, which is how do you find what moves and what doesn't, right? So our values don't move. Our mission doesn't really move, which is to help people learn to build knowledge, but the ways in which we do it move a lot and how we are rapid around it. Because simply jumping from topic to topic or trend to trend or financial condition to financial condition without the longer term view about what's the core that doesn't move, I think libraries have been very good and we've always gone through wrestling with how agile and how quick and such and that's that's legitimate that's what a real living profession does but it is i think libraries are set because we we really have interrogated over the past 10 to 15 years what is it that makes a library a library um and then we can respond and we've had to do that because there was just a, an article in uh, an editorial in institute for higher education where someone in the humanities was going well you know, we're moving to digital and people don't read anymore. And I can't assign a, to an undergraduate a book a week um, to read on things. And therefore, the library must change. And the question might be, does it? Um, or is it, you know, what's driving the change? How do we respond to change? What's causal? But it comes back to the library has always been responsive to the community, but increasingly has a solid center of its values and voices, which help guide the community, not just be guided by the community. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, that, that's a beautiful answer. Um, and I do recommend people read your chapter. Um, and I, I, this gives rise to my second question. And libraries exist in such a, a fascinating relationship with their community. Um, I mean, you know, David, you just mentioned some of the key points of this, uh, where they have to learn from their community, they have to support their community, they have to change with their community, and sometimes they have to help change their community as the world changes. Uh, do you have any guidance for libraries looking ahead the next 10 years, uh, especially as things seem to be a little bit haywire, you know, when everything from technology to climate change to social changes? Any any advice for librarians? Again, librarians of all stripes, so people working in a K through 12 school library, people working in a big public library, people working in a community college library. How can they best work with their community? Yeah, thank you. And um, and I also appreciate that David mentioned uh, the wide range of contributors to the book. Um, honestly, um, and felt so grateful for the wide range of perspectives that were shared in the books from all different kinds of library leaders and practitioners. So um, I just wanted to uh, echo that. And I'm glad that David mentioned that. In terms of your question, um, which is uh, what Frank, can you uh, say your question again? Sure. Um, I was wondering what advice you would give to librarians as they try to look ahead to the next decade of, you know, in, in a hybrid we refer to as town gown relations, but library community relations. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's so many different ways to answer that question, and um, in terms of what, um, how libraries and librarians can be working with their communities, but um, there's. I think there's a few things I'd like to mention, and I'm sure David will fill in lots of gaps. Um, but uh, I think that working with the community in terms of um, help, uh, 
helping the community through a time um, in terms of literacy support and training, I think will be an important aspect of, uh, in all different kinds of literacy. We yeah. think about AI literacy, information literacy, digital literacy. There's so many um, roles for libraries to play in this space and um, which especially today with many of the challenges that that um, um, people in our community are having in terms of finding uh, credible information and finding their way um, through um, mastering new technologies that are emerging and not maybe not having access. So I think that there's opportunities there for uh, working together. I think that another role will be, um, and already is, but I think will be enhanced is this idea of co-creation and working together with the community, um, both in terms of developing the programming, library programming and content. And um, and I think that that working in a partnership kind of relationship, I think will be good. Um, I think that, uh, libraries roles and, and you mentioned this brian i think uh in terms of playing a role in terms of during times of crisis and recovery i think will continue to be a major role that libraries will play and will need to continue to support communities um i think that also looking at ways to ensure that um their community that people in the communities have equitable access to um, both information and also technology. We're seeing growing uh, divides in terms of people's access. So those are just a few of the areas. I guess one other thing, and I attended um, a really interesting session yesterday um, and they, where they were talking about um, how do we move ahead in times of uh, political discord and how do we um, how do we work together and what is the role of the library in these in these kinds of polarized times and I think another critical role libraries will play is, is playing some sort of a, as a hub of social cohesion places mm -hmm. for discourse and bringing people together for dialogue I think will be an important role mm -hmm. oh, thank yeah, you Brian I, I think you ask a fundamental question because um, the relationship between the university and the community has always been interesting, but I want to take it on specifically because I think we're at, a, at an important juncture that's going to affect how we develop in the future. I think the juncture is AI has been, you know, overhyped and it's going to change the world and we haven't lost 60,000 jobs. But what it has done is it's introduced doubt. It's gotten to the point where if you see an image on Facebook or on whatever, you can legitimately doubt whether that's how the image was taken. With the new um, with new operating systems from both Apple and from Android from from Google, um, you can easily go in and take people out of pictures, take objects out of pictures, right. add people to them, etc. And so you're able now to really, instead of managing photos of reality, manage your visions of reality. This shifts the notion of information literacy, digital literacy, from a turn people skeptical at the right time and make them do some work, cognitive load, right? Because literacy and, and investigating authenticity is cognitive load and it's takes a lot and so a lot of it's been oh if you doubt do these things the crap test which is a crap test mm -hmm. um etc we're moving to the point now where everything is in doubt where it's enough to say i don't believe that right or that may be ai or what have you we're seeing it right now in political discourse but it's increasingly in other discourses and it moves to information literacy when you're always skeptical when you always question what's being presented and that's a huge cognitive load this then ties specifically into the count town gown relationship because higher education is part of the problem higher education is part of the problem because we have made it inaccessible it is too damn expensive it creates a massive amount of debt but worse yet while it has become inaccessible primarily because of cost, it has retained a myth of meritocracy. That is, if you're smart enough, if you're good enough, if you just got that scholarship, if you just worked that extra job, you too could get your key into higher education and therefore to an information economy. And that's not true. It's just not accessible to too many people. And people who don't get in or can't afford it are being called lacking merit. 
um, and therefore lacking agency, which creates a massive disconnect and disruption. And that leads to lack of trust between the town and gown. That leads to a lack of um, political commonality between those with a college degree and those without. I highly recommend people take a look at After the Fall of the Ivory Tower. Mm -hmm. It is a fascinating book on this. And The Deaths of Despair, because we know that when people don't see a future and don't see power in their future. When people do not feel that they have been married or have been disconnected, they will turn to things they can control. And unfortunately, what that means is we see an increasing demographic here in the United States. It's starting in in England. It's moving across the world in terms of disconnection, social isolation, which leads to things like drug addiction, alcoholism, and suicide. And it's actually bringing down the like, economic causal data shows that those three factors are bringing back down the average lifespan in this country. <laughs> so where we've always talked about this being an opportunity to get to a better life, a better, et cetera, now it's becoming a dividing line. And the people who can't take advantage of the opportunity primarily because of economic conditions, it leads to a whole symptom of political discord, dis distrust. It leads to a whole um, rejection of expertise and formal science in that system because those are the people who didn't give us power. Um, and so I think right now what we need to be thinking about with the future of academic libraries, but really the future of higher education, which is how can we get back to the original mission of allowing, of educating the people of the state, of the area, in a way that provides opportunity and not in a way that picks winners and losers. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that passionate answer to this to this question, David. I really appreciate that, especially coming from Texas, where that mission was very, very fraught. Um, uh, friends, I, I have so many responses and questions, but this is the time for you. And I just want to say in the chat, there is a whole bunch of love letters to libraries here. Uh, people celebrating uh, book club kits in libraries, the heroic mission of libraries. And I'm just glad to hear that as well, because I share that. Um, Sandy, you mentioned the digital divide and libraries are the unsung heroes of trying to cross and mitigate the digital divide and have been since the 1990s. But friends, now it's over to you for your questions and your comments. We already have three um, in the queue. So let me just remind everybody else that if you'd like to ask a question, you can either click the raised hand button and we'll beam you up on stage. Although, you know, David here might give the lie to the idea that you have to have a beer to be on stage, but I think Sandy, Sandy defeats that. <laughs> You'll be good. Um, or if you'd like, just use the Q&A box. That's that question box in the very bottom of the screen. Uh, so we actually have a question. Speaking of AI, we've already had a few thoughts about this uh, from one of our friends and a hero of uh, AI in education, uh, Brent Anders, coming to us from Armenia. Uh, and he asks the question of, oops, I thought I pressed the right button. What are your thoughts on using libraries as an important part for AI literacy development for everyone? By this, I mean making librarians subject matter experts so they can help others develop. What do you two think about that one? David, would you like to go first on this? I'll do it really quickly. Um, we, we've done some studies looking in academics at what happens when we present undergraduates with answers generated from AI and from librarians. And while there's initial skepticism and, and the students are very quickly able to identify which is which. Um, and then skepticism around the AI because they've been taught that AI hallucinates a lot. That once you get in, you begin to look at their process. What they really want is intelligence amplification. That is that the librarian and AI are working together and can give better responses. And to the point that when you're starting to investigate a topic, you want to know everything. It's the Wikipedia um, phenomenon, right? Start at Wikipedia. It's it's not may not be authoritative, but it's got so many useful links for just to begin. Right, and that's what AI is giving us. And then when it gets down to, I need to know precisely, I need to know this is real, I need to know whatever, the librarian kicks into that discourse and it works really well. So that's one. Um, I also am extraordinary, I see AI as an opportunity for libraries broadly, looking at state and public libraries um, as a way of changing a discourse, particularly the one around book banning, because it's really hard to talk about those liberal pedophile, um, you know, woke folks do a fantastic job of preparing tomorrow's workforce, right? Those two narratives don't sit well together. Um, once we can, we have serious ethical issues and legal issues to solve about copyright and representation and, and, and payment, but the ability for these systems to potentially unleash very localized, very authentic voices, right? I can't 
I don't write well. Well, good news. So AI does. If you can give outlines and corrections, et cetera. Well, I, I don't like my voice. No problem. Click. Here's a narration. Well, I don't know how to do the picture or the images. Click. Here you can do this. Now, once again, that has a huge host of issues where librarians can be along the way talking about critical thinking, can be talking about representation, can be making sure the digital divide is available. But that suddenly is, if we do it right, um, a powerful way for um, disenfranchised and minoritized voices to begin to share their view of the world in a really mm -hmm. polished way that's going to make it easier to be accepted, but also in a computational way in which they can be archived, preserved, and provide veracity to different situations. Thank you. Thank you. Great thank answer. You. Yeah. Please yeah, share. thank you, David. Um, and I, I don't have a, um, much to add to that. I think that was a great response. I do think that um, librarians will um, be needing to skim, scaling up themselves for AI as well. I think that it's still also a, a, a new skill for many uh, librarians and people in the field. And so I think some of that AI literacy that is, is something that we need to be cultivating both in um, our students and the community, but also for ourselves. And I think in that way, we will be, as we scale up ourselves, and I think that coupled with our professional training and expertise, I think will position us well to be um, helping to navigate some of the challenges that and some of the pitfalls that AI can provide and also help people leverage the opportunities that it can also provide as well. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, both of you. That's a, that's a great answer, a great combo, combo answer to uh, Brent. Uh, your wonderful question. And if, if friends, if you don't know Brent, uh, he'll probably put a link in the chat, but he's just one of my great gurus for uh, teaching with uh, AI, uh, coming to us from the American University of Armenia. Now we have uh, another question coming up. Uh, this is from Elmira Zhangju, coming from Ithaca SNR. Uh, and she has a question um, about something quite different, which was, what do you see as the role of academic libraries in supporting students' non-curricular needs, i.e. basic needs, or similarly, public libraries and addressing those needs for the broader community. Great question. Uh, not yet. That's that is a great question. Um, I think that I think that the academic library and was this for students or just for the community, or it could be for the community broadly. Oh, that's a good question. I'll answer. I'll, yeah. I'll answer the question. I'll just answer the question, then you can reframe it. Was, it, was, it was students <laughs> and the community. Yeah. So I think that there are lots of roles for the academic library to be partnering with, also with um, community, um, with the community as well as with students. I think that in the community space, there's opportunities for innovation uh, hubs and uh, partnership in developing, cultivating uh, research and innovation in local communities. And we see that happening in our library here and San Jose State University. And I see that as an opportunity um, generally for academic libraries to be uh, engaging with their community and providing uh, support um, in that way. Um, we also, there are, also kinds of uh, ways that academic libraries are supporting some of the needs of, uh, of students. And I guess this is sort of for academic, but it's also setting a little bit outside of that. And that is in terms of making sure that students have the technology that they have to support their academic and other enterprises. So loaning out laptops, loaning out, you know, phone, loaning out equipment, basically like um, things that will enable them to be able to function in um, both the academic life environment, but also in just broader um, need, meeting their broader needs within um, daily life. And so those are just a couple of ways I think um, that, that academic libraries can engage and support maybe the non-academic needs um, that of uh, their communities. I'm sure David will have many more ideas. I'll just, I'll be brief because I know we have more questions to get through. There is an excellent chance that in your libraries today, there are people who are unhoused. There's an excellent chance that people are living in their car or they're couch surfing simply because they are having trouble making things affordable. There are people in your libraries that are running away from frankly, abusive dorm situations where they are first time away from home and don't know how to deal with the social crisis that they're a part of. You have people in your in your libraries today that are doing much more than studying. 
And the question is always, is that our problem? And I, you know, I, to be clear, is that our mission? Is that something we have a stake in? And I look at it as a crucial learning issues. I mean, I go old school back to Maslow's hierarchy, which is these people don't feel safe. If these people don't feel secure, these people don't know where they're going to be tomorrow. How well can they learn? Mm -hmm. And so libraries as third space isn't just a matter of clearing out the room and putting in some bookcase, taking out the bookcases and putting in some whiteboards. It can be sleep pods, but it can also be food pantries and it can also be um, connections to social services and, and, and mental wellness yes. services on a direct connection. The, pro the thing comes back to find, you know, as we evolve over the future, what one library does to make it look and deal with the situation is different than another library and a different solution. And that's OK. I remember working with the um, with some librarians at Cornell. And they wanted to loan out kayaks and have a kayak launch right out of the right out of the library into into the lake, um, which is a gorgeous lake. And I'm missing it right now. Um, <laughs> but right. How it looks in, in San Jose, how it looks in Austin, how it looks in Armenia is going to be different and the level of which we do it. And so as librarians, as we move in the future and evolve, the, the idea is to give ourselves the liberty to vary to be hyper local in how we look and the services we provide and still claim that we are under the banner of libraries and librarians. Can I, I just want to, that, I think that's great. And I wanted to add one more thought. Um, you know, I, I was recently in Boston um, uh, visiting Simmons University and I had the opportunity to visit the MIT um, Hayden Library, a new, pretty newly rebuilt library and it was interesting to to visit there and it kind of makes me think um a, a, a part of a response to this question is i saw that one of the uh design philosophies they implemented in the library which um was uh, based on sherry turkle's um alone together mm -hmm. idea and the library providing a space where people can be alone and together and they had some really interesting design elements in their library that fostered that sense where where people are pra craving that sense of community but also want to be alone but it, it, and i think that there, there's opportunities for libraries to provide that kind of safe space for people to meet those kinds of needs and i i found that a really interesting um, approach and design philosophy, and one that I mm. can see how would be really beneficial um, for people who may be lonely but don't want to and want to be with others, but maybe not want to also feel safe and a little bit apart. Mm. Mm. That is so tricky. I mean, this is that kind of primal social political question that you have to answer every day. Uh, thank you. Thank you both for those great answers. And thank you, Elmira, for the excellent question. Now, that's an example of a Q&A box question. Now what I'd like to do is uh, have a live video question where we bring in someone on stage. So let me just quickly rearrange stuff so that uh, we're all comfortable on stage here and make room for another library director. This is uh, Dean Scott Walker. Hello, Scott. Scott. Brian, I, I only chose the video option because of my beard. I can see that it's a lovely. I'm lovely feeling concept. left out here. <laughs> I feel, I feel you stand bad. out. You stand out. Uh, it's kind of like so, a before and after picture. I just like to point that out. Yours is well groomed. All right, go ahead. Uh, so, question uh, for our colleagues: uh, You're both LIS educators, and because you're LIS educators, you prepare people uh, for any possible uh, future. Could be school librarians, could be academic librarians, could be public librarians, could be special librarians. So could each of you identify for us one trend or theme looking out toward 2035 that you think runs across or has the potential to run across all those sectors and could provide the spine for intersegmental collaboration and uh, collective library impact across a community? Well, good question. Go ahead, please. David, I'll let you go first. Well, I, I give an, a repeating answer, which to me is it's a common mission, no matter the community you're working in, whether that community is of scholars, of students, of people who live in a given area, of uh, teachers, et cetera, which is to um, improve society through facilitating knowledge creation community, which is generic. But when you get down to the notion of 
how we represent knowledge. And I think that's been a shift in all of those as well, which is it's not necessarily the materials on the floor, it's the people that are using the materials on the floor to create knowledge and such. And that switch in an academic environment, and Scott, you are my go-to for what's innovative in academic environments. I mean that quite, quite openly and honestly. But when you talk about the notion of creating common spaces, of creating digital services, but that bring people together on these, the, the uh, work you did on shared archiving when in Chicago, et cetera. Um, and then you look at public libraries and you see the same thing where they're moving into education and workshops and presenting individuals. And when you look at um, at, uh, school libraries increasingly becoming social places, once again, to be alone together, but also as a safe place to build knowledge that isn't necessarily hardwired in the curriculum. And that's interesting because inquiry-based education, that is allowing the individual to follow their passion for knowledge, is fundamental to academic libraries. It's why we're in the accreditation process, right? It's like the textbook's not enough. You need to get people interested enough to go explore on their own, and you better have a good library for them to do that exploration. Um, in public libraries, it's always, what do you want to know today? And in school libraries, it's very much the, I'm done with the testing and the forced curriculum. I want to know about snakes. And so you have this inquiry-driven instruction. And to me, that's just the beginning of, you know, talking about it. In South Carolina, we had a great forum where we put high school librarians and the uh, library staff of the University of South Carolina and said, you know, our seniors are your freshmen. What do we need to know? And they, for example, didn't know that the university had information literacy requirements. Mm -hmm. Those high schoolers were able to take it and say, if you want our students to go to the flagship University of South Carolina, you need to support libraries in doing this. And so those dialogues turn into a chance for not only collaboration, but empowerment across that spectrum. But once again, um, after Sandy's done, I want to hear your answer to that. Yeah, that, I would be interested too. Thank you. And I completely agree with everything David said. Um, I wanted to um, uh, respond actually by uh, sharing with you what I saw, what I drew out as some of the key themes from the book, which is looking across all of the chapters in the book, which is by all the different types of libraries, the different types of issues that different people uh, surfaced. And I think that there, if when I mention what I see as the key themes, I think you'll see that there's a lot of commonality that can be talked about and applied in, across all of the different types of library environments. So one of them, and David's already spoken about it, is around the community aspect of it and around the roles that libraries play in their communities and how they engage with their communities as places where people gather and interact and build connections and host events and activities. Um, and, and services and collections are community driven um, and focused. And then another theme is around collaboration and partnerships and the importance of libraries working closely with other organizations to expand their reach and impact um, so that they, and that will also allow them to off, offer broader services. Another theme focused around inclusivity and equity. And I think that that's something that applies to all libraries about the importance of breaking down barriers that prevent folks from coming to um, using services um, and taking a very broad view about what those mean in terms of accessibility, uh, you know, um, and cultural um, and, and diversity, uh, digital accessibility, all different kinds of um, aspects um, and social and uh, being sensitive to social justice issues. Another theme is around privacy and security and the importance of maintaining that within the library, um, prioritizing the uh, safety and the protection of user data, um, making people sure that people feel safe and, um, and you, while they're using their resources. Um, another area is around technology and technology integration and how important that is. And uh, we've already talked about the impact of AI and, and that that will have in libraries and how we can provide access to libraries. And then another area is focused around advocacy and futures thinking and the importance of libraries um, advocating for their value, their relevance, and also preparing for future trends and challenges and engaging um, in strategic for, um, foresight. So uh, those are six major theme areas that I would 
say came out of the book. And I think you could apply equally as, and importantly to all of the different areas um, of uh, libraries and, and library environments. I just have to put it in and now, and now your turn as instructor. I know you've been instructing in Dominican for a while, et cetera. What do you see? Uh, so, you know, I, if I'm going to do it quickly, I should be operational. So when I was in Chicago, which you mentioned, we worked together across the city to foster awareness and use and access to local history resources. We did that because we all shared those resources, but the reason we shared all those resources is because there are few major cities in this country that are more in love with their own history than the city of Chicago. It is a spine that draws people together from fourth grade to social security. And so by making our collaboration across those sectors on that theme, we're able to touch um, school kids. We're able to support the um, uh, National History Day, which is active across the city. We're able to interest high school students in our universities, helping our recruitment stream. And we're able to ensure ongoing engagement with um, adults as they move past college, but continue to engage with libraries, archives, and museums in higher education and other cultural organizations. We're building a spine for collaboration that is essential to all of our own programs, school programs, academic programs, museum programs, but we do it in a way that reinforces throughout the lifespan uh, interest and awareness of libraries, archives, and museums. Ooh. And so that I think is, you know, that was, that was our theme there. Here in San Diego, our theme has been around bringing libraries together to address social issues that have been identified by our elected leadership, including Ooh. health misinformation, climate change and sustainability. All again, with that idea that what we're doing is we're reinforcing throughout the lifespan, the engagement and awareness of the value of libraries and in, in my in the higher ed sector we're engaging people ahead of time in order to build the recruitment stream to me those are the the, the sort of themes that that allow us to really further the, that sort of collaboration in a way that goes beyond what we've known traditionally like say you know one book programs or or k-12 visits those sorts of okay. things so now I have to use that just really quickly, and I'm sorry, Brian, give me one second to get on a soapbox of mine, which is what both of those examples really demonstrate to me is it's not, let's take a program, everyone reads one book, or we'll all do local history, I'll do health, and do that everywhere. But the idea is everyone should be doing the idea of combining and working together. So today, if we could all promise and hold our hands up and say, we will never use the word toolkit ever again, and instead talk about starter kit or something to that end, which is part of the power of librarianship and the professional librarianship is not to take something, standardize it and implement it, but to take something, understand its value and adapt it to very local settings. And so, um, amen. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for this, this conversation within our conversation. Uh, Scott, thank you for a really great question. Uh, and David and Sandy, thank you for the answers. Uh, friend, that's an example of a video question. Uh, we have some more questions coming in. I want to make sure we get in as many of them as possible. This is an, obviously a very, very rich subject. And uh, I want to make sure that we get everyone gets a chance. Uh, we have one question coming uh, from uh, Columbian College in South Carolina. And uh, this is a question that has to do with um, community, but in a different way. Laura Whistler asks, how would you suggest academic libraries could cultivate community, even spark the idea that learning and community matters when learners seem reluctant about community? I just had to shout out, uh, Laura, I hope you uh, survived the most recent hurricanes okay. So how do, you, how do academic libraries get community learning going when that community doesn't seem too into it? Yeah, that's a great question. David, would you like to kick us off with that? 
Um, first step, we need to define community. Um, to me, a community is, is a group of people organized around some known principle, where I work, where I study, where I live, what have you, and that has a built-in system to distribute scarce resources, money, time, effort, space, et cetera. Um, and so to begin with, the other part is that beyond that, communities are not homogenous and are often in conflict because of distribution of scarce resources. So I think the first thing is we as a profession need to get better on be, on our definitions. Um, and whenever I talk about community, people automatically assume public and location. Many pe people are part of many, many, many communities, right? So I'm a, a father and I'm a professor and I'm a live in Texas and I grew up in Ohio and, you know, religious communities, etc. And so we often find people do want to participate in communities it's just not necessarily the one that we've set up or the one that we're pushing and oftentimes the answer is to go to communities and not to try and build them artificially um in in public library examples and i apologize for this um for not having an academic one top of mind but sending librarians to sit in the chamber of commerce um and i had this happen in north sort of in, in central new york and it got to the point where they wouldn't start the chamber of commerce meeting until the librarian came because the librarian was so instrumental in knowing what else was going on in the community and sharing it and then eventually this librarian was elected to the chamber and then was elected as president of the chamber um in terms of being where this conversation was having as opposed to waiting for them to walk indoors um and and there's a lot of conversation about the need for space if you talk about academic libraries moving into the future we just don't need as much physical space for certain collections like the reference collection mm -hmm. we do need and have ongoing space needs for the archival feature that we do and the long-term feature that we do um, there is a need for alternative shelving as i was taught to say um, and compact shelving and such but we still need places to come together um, and so the, the long answer is first we have to acknowledge that we're in the community business for a long time libraries didn't and then we are, then we need, need to get better at understanding, analyzing the community. And the shorthand version is go to that community and support them when welcome. Don't necessarily feel you can automatically make them just because you have wide open study spaces. Thank you. And I, I'd like, and I, I think that was a great, a great answer. And I would just add that I think that um, once you understand who the community is, and per David's comments, I think that um, I think it's important to connect with that community to understand a few things. One is uh, understand understand more about what they are interested in and how they like to communicate and engage. And um, so, for example, we may think that we they want to engage in person in the library or something like that but they maybe they're really on discord and maybe that's where we need to be if we want to connect with the community that we're trying to target and to um to um, inspire to to be more active learners so i think understanding more about the community itself how how they um, interact, what motivates them, how they best learn, and what is most interesting to them. Mm. And then also establishing uh, the kinds of um, either partnerships or relationships with uh, some of the key um, key leaders or uh, supporters of a community to then be able to um, establish better communication and approaches to engaging them. Well, thank you. Um, well, first of all, a great question and, and wonderful answers, uh, both Sandy and David. Um, I'm seeing the clock ticking and we have a question. Uh, we have a whole bunch of questions and I'm going to, uh, if I could just ask the questioners who haven't had a chance to meet, for me to put their questions forward, if you would object to me emailing these questions to our guests, just please let me know in the chat. Um, one uh, question comes from a dear friend who can't actually make it this hour because she's on the desk. Um, and uh, this is, uh, uh, for me, one of my favorite librarians in the world, Jessamine West uh, from Vermont. And she asks this question about corporate ownership of digital content. She says, um, I'm interested in learning what you all think about the most hopeful collaborative projects that address the fact 
that large corporations have been slowly taking over a lot of what we thought of as the content of libraries, changing our model from purchasing to licensing. There are lots of cool projects out there. I'm curious what you think. Well, um, I think that if, I think it would be, if you read the chapter that Erin Berman writes in the book, I think it's a good starting point. She has a really interesting perspective around privacy and around um, the ownership of data and how libraries interact with, um, with, comp with uh, those uh, companies and databases that have um, a lot of the ownership of data and what that means for libraries. Um, but I uh, think that, um, I think David, I'd like to turn this over to you uh, for, if, in case you have some thoughts and I'm gonna give it some more thought as you're talking. <laughs> I got admit. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've been, I was in, I don't have grand answers because what I found is is not hopeful in the sense of I look at things like Hottie Trust and I look for look mm -hmm. at the Digital Public Library of America and I mm -hmm. go, it could be so much more. Um, I think fundamentally, if we're talking about, and I don't disagree at, at all in terms of a, a major corporate um, takeover of the commons, that the short answer is copyright needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. um, we have some acceptable use in it. We have some uh, carved out use for archives that I think is vital mm -hmm. and important. Um, but I think that we realize we need to acknowledge that the U.S. Uh, Copyright Office is in the Library of Congress. And I know before anyone sends me all the messages, I know they run as an independent agency and all these other things. But it means something that it's there. Um, and I think that this comes towards advocacy. And the advocacy is not librarians storming the Capitol. Well, no one should storm the Capitol. Um, but not, not necessarily librarians making the big advocacy moves. But in getting the communities that are essential to move towards that. We to look at the idea that it's impinging on higher education, going back to Scott's example, right? What they're building that spine where all the people across the entire community are a part of it. If what we see is copyright and corporate interest being able to break that spine of connection, the community has a vested interest in advocating for making exceptions and changes in that. So um, I, I wanna, first of all, I, I feel like I'm, disappointing one of my favorite librarians and people in the whole world, Jasmine. But um, to me, the larger issue is if, if corporate consolidation of media and moving to streaming media and changing the model from ownership to whatever is a major change in how copyright is utilized in this country. And if it is damaging the common interest and the common good in academia and public and schools, then we need to look at a systemic change, which to me begins with copyright. Mm, mm. That's a huge, huge one, and the big legislative process that we haven't done since what 1976, really. Oh uh, well, the the, the 1999 and the Digital Millennium Copyright yeah, was yeah. a pretty substantial change, That's and true. Um, true. Uh, we're living. It had some things right, and it had some things very wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's also now very out of date. Well, thank you, thank you. That's a great answer, um, Sandy. Did you want to add more to that? No, I I didn't. Um, I think I think we're pretty much out of time, and I think David put the fine point on it. <laughs> we're a good team. It's all good. In the in yeah. the chat, uh, our friend Mark Corbett Wilson said the Mickey Mouse Act, yes, um, which has only only recently stopped happening. Uh, we have one minute left, and I'm wondering if I could ask each of you to do two things, uh, which is first, if you could just give us a really quick like a hint, a glimpse, a glance at what a library might look like in 2035. Now, I'm taking to heart, David, your chapter, which is that there are fragmented libraries, that there are many different ones, and you repeated that point here. So just give me an example of what one library might look like. And if you could follow it up by saying, how do we keep up with you? Where do we where do we find you online if we want to keep finding out you know, your, your, your future work? Um, David, you get to go first because uh, you're geographically closest to me right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, the short version is um, the Library of 2035 needs to look really, really like the community it's serving, whether that's an academic community, whether Ooh. that's a public community or not. So let me pick on Texas and I'm sitting in one. What we know in Texas is that it will continue to have a strong archival function. Its job is to keep a lot of, a lot of the 
product of other academic outputs around the world. However, they are increasingly investing not simply in providing information in um, in in open access, but supporting other open access services. So, places like Texas that has a lot of resources can become a funding agent for a lot of open access, open repository systems around the world. So I think that's going to be a big part moving forward where our library is going to look much more like a network, um, as well as maintaining a physical place for students to interact and get away from um, troubles outside the world room. Um, but it's going to have, it's going to be once again, much more networked in its function and much more diffuse on the edges. Um, and I'll put in the link my my web page um, and you can find stuff from there. Excellent. So excellent. Uh, that's excellent on both counts. I, I like that networked uh, reflective university and uh, of course I like your web page. Sandy, editor of this book, major contributor to this book as well. What's what's a library of 2035 looking like for you? Give, give us a, a hint, just a sketch of that. Yeah. So, and and just I I I also I I think that libraries are going to be the cornerstone of their communities, and they're going to be very focused on some of those core values that I talked about. Some of the access to providing access to information, supporting learning, and serving as a place to engage in crucial. And I think that those are going to be some of the key roles for libraries to play in the future. And if you want to reach me, then um, you can reach me best on LinkedIn. And I also just wanted to mention that um, I posted in the chat that I did do have the opportunity to do webcast interviews with almost all of the book uh, contributors. And those are available for free. And you can um, hear more about people's perspectives. And it doesn't necessarily exactly follow what they said in the book. So it builds on and amplifies some of their thoughts. So I encourage you, if you're interested in, in seeing and hearing more from those contributors, that would be a great place to go. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Sandy Hirsch, David Lankis, thank you so much. This has been a great hour. I really appreciate your work on this book, and I really appreciate this hour of conversation. I, I wish you both the very best. I look forward to circling back with you next year to see what you're else up to. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. But don't go away yet, friends. Uh, we have to just uh, wrap this up by mentioning what we're up to next. And let me thank everybody for their excellent questions. Um, if you want to keep talking about this, uh, social media stands by waiting for you. You can see if you want to at me at Twitter, LinkedIn, Macedon, Threads, or Blue Sky, we'd be happy to hear from you. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions, our archives going back in time, uh, just hit the archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you'd like to look at our upcoming sessions on other topics besides libraries, we have sessions on enrollment, on the right to learn, reforming grading and educability. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to see more. Thank you again all for uh, being with us this Halloween day. I'll close out with my goggles just to remind you of what the holiday is about. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, everyone who works in libraries, keep doing the important, great work. Um, take care, everybody. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.